This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Monica Bruce, London, December 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 109. The Assizes. The Benedetta affair, as it was called at the Palais and by people in general, had produced a tremendous sensation. Frequenting the Café de Paris, the Boulevard de Gand, and the Bois de Boulogne, during his brief career of splendor, the false Cavalcanti had formed a host of acquaintances. The papers had related his various adventures, both as the man of fashion and the galley slave, and as every one who had been personally acquainted with Prince Andrea Cavalcanti experienced a lively curiosity in his fate, they all determined to spare no trouble in endeavouring to witness the trial of Monsieur Benedetto for the murder of his comrade in chains. In the eyes of many, Benedetto appeared, if not a victim too, at least an instance of the fallibility of the law. Monsieur Cavalcanti, his father, had been seen in Paris, and it was expected that he would reappear to claim the illustrious outcast. Many also, were not aware of the circumstances attending his withdrawal from Paris, were struck with the worthy appearance, the gentle manly bearing, and the knowledge of the world displayed by the old patrician, who certainly played the nobleman very well, so long as he said nothing, and made no arithmetical calculations. As for the accused himself, many remembered him as being so amiable, so handsome, and so liberal, that they chose to think him the victim of some conspiracy, since in this world large fortunes frequently excite the malevolence and jealousy of some unknown enemy. Every one, therefore, ran to the court, some to witness the sight, others to comment upon it. From seven o'clock in the morning a crowd was stationed at the iron gates, and an hour before the trial commenced the hall was full of the privileged, before the entrance of the magistrates, and indeed frequently afterwards, a court of justice, on days when some especial trial is to take place, resembles a drawing room, where many persons recognize each other, and converse if they can do so without losing their seats, or, if they are separated by too great a number of lawyers, communicate by signs. It was one of the magnificent autumn days which make amends for a short summer, the clouds which M. de Villefort had perceived at sunrise had all disappeared as if by magic, and one of the softest and most brilliant days of September shone forth in all its splendour. Beauchamp, one of the kings of the press, and therefore claiming the right of a throne everywhere, was eyeing everybody through his monocle. He perceived Chateau Renaud and Debray, who had just gained the good graces of a sergeant at arms, and who had persuaded the latter to let them stand before instead of behind him as they ought to have done. The worthy sergeant had recognized the minister's secretary and the millionaire, and by way of paying extra attention to his noble neighbors, promised to keep their places while they paid a visit to Beauchamp. Well, said Beauchamp, we shall see our friend. Yes, indeed, replied Debré. That worthy prince. Do you take those Italian princes? A man, too, who could boast of Dante for a genealogist and could reckon back to the Divine Comedy. A nobility of the rope, said Chateau Renaud phlegmatically. He will be condemned, will he not? asked Debré of Beauchamp. My dear fellow, I think we should ask you that question. You know such news much better than we do. Did you see the President at the Minister's last night? Yes. What did he say? Something which will surprise you. Oh, make haste and tell me then. It's a long time since that has happened. Well, he told me that Benedetto, who's considered a serpent of subtlety and a giant of cunning, is really but a very commonplace, silly rascal, and altogether unworthy of the experiments that will be made on his phrenological organs after his death. Bah, said Beauchamp, he played the prince very well. Yes, for you who detest those unhappy princes, Beauchamp, and are always delighted to find fault with them. But not for me who discovered a gentleman by instinct, and who sent out an aristocratic family like a very bloodhound of heraldry. Then you never believed in the principality? Yes, in the principality, 
but not on the prince. Not so bad, said Bouchon. Still, I assure you, he passed very well with many people. I saw him at the minister's houses. Ah, yes, said Chateau The idea of thinking ministers understand anything about princes? There is something in what you have just said, said Bouchon, laughing. But, said de Bré to Bouchon, if I spoke to the president, you must have been with the procureur. It was an impossibility. For the last week, Monsieur de Villefort has secluded himself. It is natural enough. This strange chain of domestic afflictions, followed by the no less strange death of his daughter. Strange? What do you mean, Bouchon? Oh, yes, do you pretend that all this has been unobserved at the minister, said Bouchon, placing his eyeglass in his eye, where he tried to make it remain. My dear sir, said Chateau allow me to tell you that you do not understand that manoeuvre with the eyeglass half so well as Debré. Give him a lesson, Debré. Stay, said Bouchon, surely I am not deceived. What is it? It is she. Whom do you mean? They said she had left. Mademoiselle Eugenie, said Chateau Renaud, has she returned? No, but her mother. Madame Danglars? Nonsense. Impossible, said Chateau Renaud. Only ten days after the flight of her daughter, and three days from the bankruptcy of her husband? Debré collared slightly and followed with his eyes the direction of Beauchamp's glance. Come, he said, it is only a veiled lady, some foreign princess, perhaps the mother of Cavalcanti. But you were just speaking on a very interesting topic, Bouchon. I? Yes, you were telling us about the extraordinary death of Valentine. Ah, yes, so I was. But how is it that Madame de Villefort is not here? Poor dear woman, said Debré, she is no doubt occupied in distilling balm for the hospitals, or in making cosmetics for herself or friends. Do you know, she spends two or three thousand crowns a year in this amusement. But I wonder she is not here. I should have been pleased to see her, for I like her very much. And I hate her, said Chateau Renaud. Why? I do not know. Why do we love? Why do we hate? I detest her from antipathy. Or rather, by instinct? Perhaps so. But to return to what you were saying, Bouchon. Well, do you know why they die so multitudinously at Monsieur de Villefort's? Multitudinously is good, said Chateau Renaud. My good fellow, you'll find the word in Saint-Simon. But the thing itself, said Monsieur de Villefort. But let's get back to the subject. Talking of that, said Debré, Madame was making inquiries about that house, which for the last three months has been hung with black. Who is Madame? asked Chateau Renaud. The minister's wife, pardieu. Oh, your pardon, I never visit ministers. I leave that to the princess. Really, you were only before sparkling, but now you are brilliant. Take compassion on us, or, like Jupiter, you will wither us up. I will not speak again, said Chateau Renaud. Pray have compassion upon me. Do not take up every word I say. Come, let us endeavour to get to the end of our story, Bouchon. I told you that yesterday Madame made inquiries of me upon the subject. Enlighten me, and I will then communicate my information to her. Well, gentlemen, the reason people die so multitudinously... I like the word, at Monsieur de Villefort's, is that there is an assassin in the house. The two young men shuddered, for the same idea had more than once occurred to them. And who is the assassin? they asked together. Young Edward. A burst of laughter from the auditors did not in the least disconcert the speaker, who continued, Yes, gentlemen, Edward, the infant phenomenon, who is quite an adept in the art of killing. You are jesting. Not at all. I yesterday engaged a servant, who had just left Monsieur de Villefort. I intend sending him away tomorrow, for he eats so enormously, to make up for the fast imposed upon him by his terror in that house. Well, now listen. We are listening. It appears the child has obtained possession of a bottle containing some drug, which he every now and then uses against those who have displeased him. First, Monsieur and Madame de saint Meron incurred his displeasure. So he poured out three drops of his elixir. Three drops were sufficient. Then followed Barois, the old servant of Monsieur Noirtier, who sometimes rebuffed this little wretch. He therefore received the same quantity of the elixir. 
The same happened to Valentine, of whom he was jealous. He gave her the same dose as the others, and all was over for her, as well as the rest. "'Why, what nonsense are you telling us?' said Chateau Renaud. "'Yes, it is an extraordinary story,' said Bouchon. "'Is it not?' "'That is absurd,' said Debré. "'Ah,' said Bouchon, "'you doubt me. "'Well, you can ask my servant, "'or rather him who will no longer be my servant tomorrow. "'It was the talk of the house.' "'And this elixir, where is it? "'What is it?' "'The child conceals it. "'But where did he find it? "'In his mother's laboratory. "'Does his mother, then, keep poisons in her laboratory? "'How can I tell? "'You are questioning me like a king's attorney. "'I only repeat what I have been told. "'Unlike my informant, I can do no more. "'The poor devil would eat nothing from fear. "'It is incredible.' No, my dear fellow, it is not at all incredible. You saw the child pass through the Rue Richelieu last year, who amused himself with killing his brothers and sisters by sticking pins in their ears while they slept. The generation of followers are very precocious. Come, Beauchamp, said Chateau Renaud, I will bet anything you do not believe a word of all you have been telling us. I do not see the Count of Monte Cristo here. He is worn out, said Debray. Besides, could not well appear in public, since he has been the dupe of the Cavalcanti, who, it appears, presented themselves to him with false letters of credit, and cheated him out of a hundred thousand francs upon the hypothesis of this principality. By the way, Monsieur de Chateau Renaud, asked Beauchamp, how is Morel? Ma foi, I have called three times without once seeing him. Still, his sister did not seem uneasy, and told me that though she had not seen him for two or three days, she was sure he was well. Ah, now I think of it, the Count of Monte Cristo cannot appear in the hall, said Bouchon. Why not? Because he is an actor in the drama. Has he assassinated anyone, then? No, on the contrary, they wish to assassinate him. You know that it was in leaving his house that Monsieur de Caderousse was murdered by his friend Benedetto? You know that the famous waistcoat was found in his house, containing the letter which stopped the signature of the marriage contract. Do you see the waistcoat? There it is, all blood-stained on the desk, as a testimony of the crime. Ah, very good. Hush, gentlemen, here's the court. Let us go back to our places. A noise was heard in the hall. The sergeant called his two patrons with an energetic hum, and the doorkeeper appearing called out with that shrill voice peculiar to his order, ever since the days of Beaumarchais. The court, gentlemen! End of chapter 109